Welcome to St. Ignatius Chapel. Today we celebrate the Lord's Passion. Our celebrant today is Jesuit Father Anthony Egan. Remember your mercies, O Lord, and with your eternal protection, sanctify your servants, for whom Christ your Son, by the shedding of his blood, established the Paschal Mystery, who lives and reigns for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Isaiah. Behold, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. As many were astonished at him, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the sons of men. So shall he startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, they shall see. For that which they have heard, they shall understand. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or comeliness that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that made us whole, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one of us to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked, and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When he makes himself an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. 
He shall see the fruit of the travail of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The responsorial psalm. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. In you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your justice, set me free. Into your hands I commend my spirit. You will redeem me, O Lord, O faithful God. Because of all my foes, I have become a reproach, an object of scorn to my neighbours and of fear to my friends. Those who see me in the street flee from me. I am forgotten like someone dead and have become like a broken vessel. But as for me, I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My lot is in your hands. Deliver me from the hands of my enemies and those who pursue me. Let your face shine on your servant. Save me in your merciful love. Be strong. Let your heart take courage, all who hope in the Lord. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brethren, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we have not a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is, who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sinning. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard for his godly fear. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Glory and praise to you, O Christ. Glory and praise to you, O Christ. Christ became obedient for us unto death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which, above, which is above every name. Glory, Glory and praise to you, O Christ. Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. At that time, Jesus went forth with his disciples across the Kidron Valley, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. And Judas, procuring a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to befall him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, whom do you seek? 
And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word which he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the chalice which the Father has given me? So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews seized Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had given counsel to the Jews, so it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did the other disciple. As this disciple was known to the high priest, he entered the court of the high priest along with Jesus, while Peter stood outside the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the maid who kept the door and brought Peter in. The maid who kept the door said to Peter, Are not you also one of, his ma of, of this man's disciples? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple, where all Jews come together. I have said nothing secretly. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, bear witness to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They said to him, Are not you also one of his disciples? He denied it. I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a kinsman of the man whose, Peter, whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once the cock crowed. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the praetorium. It was early. They themselves did not want to enter the praetorium, so that they might not be defiled, but might eat Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, if this man were not an evildoer, we would not have hanged him over. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own laws. The Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death. This was to fulfill the words which Jesus had spoken, to show by what death he was about to die. Pilate entered the praetorium again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or do others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priest have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingship is not of this world. If my kingship were of this world, my servants would fight, that I might not be handed over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? 
After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no crime in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. Will you have me release for you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head and clothed him in a purple robe. And they came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no crime in him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no crime in him. The Jews answered him, We have the law, and by that law he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. When Pilate heard these words, he was even more afraid. He entered the praetorium again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, You will not speak to me. Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me to you has the greatest guilt. Upon this, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king sets himself against Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. There they crucified him with two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote a title and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. The chief priests of the Jews then said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garment and made it four parts, one for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was without seam, woven from top to bottom. And they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture. They parted my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did this. But standing by the cross of Jesus was his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing near, he said to his mother, 
Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A bowl full of vinegar stood there. So they put a sponge full of the vinegar on hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, in order to prevent the bodies from remaining on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth, that you may also believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not a bone on him shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, They shall look on him whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him leave. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who had at first come to him by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds weight. They took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb where no one had ever been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, as the tomb was close as hand, they laid Jesus there. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. So what's good about Good Friday? If you look at it, it recounts what many would call a political murder. Not quite an assassination because there seems to have been some kind of legal process, however tenuous it might have been. So what's good about Good Friday? For centuries, this story that we read as part of our faith has been turned by some into an excuse for anti-Semitism, for the persecution of Jews. What's good about Good Friday, particularly when we live in a time where we're all on lockdown, where people are sick, where thousands have died? What's good about Good Friday? I've asked these questions for a long time. The way I deal with these questions is research and study. How do I do that? I look at what might have been. I look at the best available historical evidence to understand what's happening in this gospel. Because on a very simple reading, it doesn't add up. The first thing I learned was that this gospel was written by a community of Jewish Christians who had been excommunicated from the synagogue some decade or so before this gospel was written. And so for them, 
it was a case of, to use that wonderful Afrikaans word, brudertus, conflict among siblings, usually the most vicious of all. Hence, the way in which a handful of an elite in collaboration with the Roman Empire are turned into the whole Jewish nation. But let's take it one step further. We can see even further that Jesus was ultimately put to death by the Romans. He was crucified. Yes, in fact, the Sanhedrin could condemn someone to death for blasphemy, but the punishment was by stoning. Crucifixion was the Roman means of getting rid of political troublemakers, rebels, insurrectionists, I suppose what we call terrorists, in their day. That is how Jesus died. It's also, historically, very difficult to square our understanding of Pontius Pilate with the Pontius Pilate history has come to know and loathe. Roman historians, a Jewish historian like Josephus, contemporary historians who reweigh the evidence in the light of 2,000 years are all agreed. Pontius Pilate was a psychopathic thug who hated the Jews and would do everything opposite to what they wanted. He was not your ideal Roman governor. That helps us, perhaps, to get a perspective on this gospel, a perspective on Jesus' death. On one level, it is simply the exercise of an occupying power destroying those they considered to be a threat. Jesus' political theater, riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, both imitating the kind of Roman triumphs that no doubt would have greeted Pontius Pilate when he arrived, but also a parody of the whole idea of power. Let's look further at the way in which Jesus is presented in this gospel in particular. Each gospel is different. Each gospel gives us an angle on Jesus. I think the key words about Jesus in this gospel are the words, I am. Ego eimi in the Greek. I am who you seek. I am the king. I am son of God. Where have we heard this I am before? We've heard it of Moses at the burning bush. Who are you? Moses asks. And God says, I am who I am. And this whole gospel of John sums it up beautifully in the prologue where he says, the beginning was the word. The word was God and the word was with God. This is Jesus simply saying things like it is. This is who I am. If you don't like me, too bad. Look at the way Jesus responds to everyone in the Passion. He is not for a moment afraid. He knows what's going to happen, but he will not back down. He will not compromise who he is. So when Pontius Pilate tries to interrogate him, Jesus ends up interrogating Pontius Pilate to the point where Pontius Pilate, at least according to this gospel, is confused. He doesn't even know what truth is by the end of it all. And on the cross, Jesus sees his mother and the beloved disciple. And rather than seeking sympathy, he immediately moves into action. Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. Jesus is in command to the very end. He even says things that fulfill scripture, I thirst. And his final words, 
It is finished. Well, some folks, when they look at the Greek, say that there is a better translation. It is accomplished. I have done what I have done. The other Gospels recount the, the crucifixion as a kind of tragedy. I would suggest that this Gospel, amidst all the pain and suffering, is an account of triumph. The triumph of one who refused to give in to anything but the principles that he lived with all his life, the principles that came from his father. It is accomplished. Indeed, when we read of his death, some translations of the Greek would say, not he gave up his spirit, but he rendered up the spirit. It was a free act. Jesus dies a free person. He cannot change the world he's living in. He cannot change his circumstances. But he freely chooses to face it with courage. In a time where we are faced with all kinds of difficulties, where we wonder what's going to happen next, perhaps that's all we can expect and all we can do. We can face the challenge courageously. We can face the challenge in faith. We can face the challenge even in the depths of sorrow and sadness and death. In faith that this is not the final word, but the stage towards resurrection. As we wait with Jesus in the tomb, let us wait in hope. Let us wait in confidence in the resurrection, in our resurrection, particularly our resurrection in these very difficult times. My brothers and sisters, let us pray for our needs, the needs of the church and the needs of all the world, for our holy church. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for the holy church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her and to unite her throughout the whole world and to grant that, leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God the Father Almighty. Almighty ever-living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to all the nations, watch over the works of your mercy that your church spread throughout the world may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. For the Pope. Let us pray also for our most holy father, Pope Francis, that God our Lord, who chose him for, for the order of bishops, may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church, to govern and guide the holy people of God. Almighty ever-living God, by whose decree all things are founded, look with favour on our prayers, and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people, governed by you their Maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. 
for all orders and degrees of the faithful. Let us pray also for our bishop, Uti, for his auxiliary, Duncan, for all bishops, priests, and deacons of the church, and for the whole of the faithful people. Almighty ever-living God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayer for your ministers, that by the gift of your grace all may serve you faithfully, through Christ our Lord. Amen. For catechumens everywhere. Let us pray also for catechumens, that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their inmost hearts and unlock the gates of his mercy, that having received forgiveness of all their sins through the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Christ Jesus our Lord. Almighty ever-living God, who make your church ever fruitful with new offspring, increase the faith and understanding of all catechumens, that reborn in the font of baptism, they may be added to the number of your adopted children. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. For the unity of Christians. Let us pray also for all our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ, that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth to gather them together and keep them one in his one church. Almighty ever-living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. For the Jewish people. Let us pray also for the Jewish people, to whom the Lord our God spoke first, that he may grant them to advance in love of his name and in faithfulness to his covenant. Almighty ever-living God, who bestowed your promises on Abraham and his descendants, graciously hear the prayers of your church that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. Amen. For those who do not believe in Christ, let us pray also for those who do not believe in Christ, that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter on the way of salvation. Almighty, ever-living God, grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with a sincere heart they may find the truth and that we ourselves being constant in mutual love and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life may be made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. For those who do not believe in God, let us pray also for those who do not acknowledge God, that following what is right in sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God himself. Almighty ever-living God, who created all people, to seek you always by desiring you and by finding you come to rest. Grant, we pray, that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of the good works done by those who believe in you. And so in gladness confess you, the one true God and Father of our human race, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. For those in public office, let us pray also for those in public office, that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will for the true peace and freedom of all. 
almighty ever-living God, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of peoples, look with favor, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world, the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace, and freedom of religion may, through your gift, be made secure, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. For those in tribulation, let us pray, dearly beloved, to God the Father Almighty, that he may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, granting to travelers safety, to pilgrims return, health to the sick, and salvation to the dying. Almighty, ever-living God, comfort of mourners, strength of all who toil, may the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you, that all may rejoice, because in their hour of need, your mercy was at hand, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And in this time of great difficulty, let us spend a moment adding our prayers to the prayers of Christians and people of all faiths everywhere at this time. For those who work to heal people with the coronavirus, for those who do research to find a cure, and for all who serve the broader community in this difficulty. And we make this prayer too through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the Saviour of the world. And let us adore. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the Saviour of the world. And let us adore. Behold the wood of the cross, on which hung the Saviour of the world. And let us May abundant blessings, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people who have honoured the death of your Son in the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure 
through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.